we are live. Um, it's weird because I can't see people apart from you, David, but um, I gather there's a lot of parents out there in the um, in the ether. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Shuna Hubble. I'm head of careers at Barton. Um, and so I'm here to help you. Know, I help my team helps your students, your children through the kind of muddy waters of uh, the university applications or choosing an applications process. Um, and we have we, the HE Fair that, uh, that the University of Southampton are sponsoring this week uh, has already opened. I hope some of you have been able to visit it virtually. Um, and we've had a lot of students at the talks um, during the day as well today, which has been really exciting. Um, it's actually the first time we've obviously done a virtual HE Fair. Um, and we already think it's, it's going really well. So, um, but without further ado, I want to introduce you to David Wynne Stanley who is uh, Head of Undergraduate Admissions at the University of Southampton. Uh, Southampton is our local Russell Group University. Uh, it's got an outstanding reputation far and wide. Um, and I think he's going to tell you um, a bit about the higher education landscape, how things are looking at the moment, um, and also how um, and you know, things to do with admissions and, and all the things that you need to know. If there's anything that he doesn't cover, but that you'd like to know, then you just put questions in the chat function. Um, please feel, feel free to do that throughout the talk, and then I will just highlight ones that um, that 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 have maybe you know, have been asked a few times or whatever. So feel free to ask anything you like. Um, well, within reason, David. Um, I'm, so just anything anything that you'd like him to answer, because he is the voice of universities for parents this week. So um, it's it's lovely to see him. So. Um, I'm just going to hand over to you, David. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that introduction, Shuna, and hello to everyone there. Um, as Shuna says, it's quite strange because um, we could just be talking out into the ether. Um, we, do, we don't know if anyone's there. So um, hello. I'm hoping that you've all made it to this um, broadcast today um, and that what I'm about to say uh, is of interest. Um, as Shuna said, any questions that come through, uh, please do let me know. And they'll, they'll pop up in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so quite a, quite a broad ranging topic that we're, that we're looking at today. Um, but <clears throat> I thought I'd just say um, a few words of, of welcome from the University of Southampton. Uh, so I'm Director of Global Recruitment and Admissions at the University of Southampton. And that means that I cover all of our work that we do with schools and colleges, um, our open days, for example. Uh, also our international activities, so where we have global partnerships, uh, where we uh, recruit students from all over the world. That falls in my area as well. But most importantly, I suspect for this talk, uh, the admissions side as well. Um, I've been at Southampton for just over a year, uh, only actually, of course, on campus for about five weeks. Um, and I think that's that's given me quite a, an interesting insight into the university, which I will cover as we go through. Um, but I think importantly, as Shuna says, it is a remarkable institution. And I think it's the, um, well, well, we'll talk about some of the reasons for that very shortly, but it is quite fantastic having uh, a university of, of such global renown in Southampton. And um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be working there. Um, and it's really demonstrated the very best of what universities are for. So I'm also delighted to be here and, and invited to speak at Barton Peverell's event. I think the way that schools, colleges, universities and, and nearly every other aspect of life has adapted to the current pandemic situation is, is remarkable. And I think also there are some real benefits, and this is perhaps one of them, um, that makes it rather easier for um, working parents and, and students to access all of the advice and um, uh, information out there about higher education without necessarily having to travel, without having to get to the college for a particular time and on a particular night. And so hopefully this provides a really accessible way um, to, <clears throat> to, to access that information. So in terms of the things I'm intending on covering today, um, sorry about the lighting, that's quite bright from my own screen there. Um, we will talk about a little bit about the current landscape and what admissions to higher education looks like at the moment. Um, the impact of coronavirus on that and the impact on students joining us, but also about 
why you would go to university and the sorts of reasons students do um, and choosing a course in university obviously the, the sorts of um, questions that students will have and the, the options that are available to them and then turning that around um, as we always do to what we as universities are looking for. And I think that's an important thing to bear in mind throughout this whole process from now until um, your students arrive with us, in that the sort of locus of control changes throughout that. So at that point where your students are considering all of their options, obviously the students are in control, determining where they're going to apply to. But once they have applied, that shift of power comes to the universities where we'll determine whether or not we think that this student is right for us. And that goes back and forth throughout that process. And we hope that we keep it as open and transparent as we can um, to make the right decisions for students. And I think that's the, the key theme that you'll find in this talk is about what's right for students and how do we ensure that students find the best place for them that suits them and their ambitions and their career goals um, and what their interests are as we go through. So that's what we're going to cover today, and hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end as well. So a little bit about the national picture. And last year was a year like no other. Um, and in my career, and I've worked across a number of different universities, um, I've never known a year like it for very obvious reasons, but also in terms of how that impacted on the process of students getting to university um, from their schools and colleges, uh, mature students and people from, from industry. Um, and I've, I've just picked out some interesting things that I found from the UCAS End of Cycle report from 2020. And that covers a whole, the whole gamut of, of information, where students came from, what universities they went to, what subjects they chose to study. But I think it's, it's remarkable that in a year of disruption that we had in 2020, um, we saw a record 37% of all 18-year-olds in the UK entering a higher education course in September. Um, and that, that hides some quite different uh, statistics across different areas of the country. Um, in London, we saw 49.2% of 18-year-olds go to higher education. That goes down to 386 in the southeast of England. And actually, the, the, the lowest national percentage in the southwest at just over 32%. So quite a regional differentiation between the participation level in higher education. And there's, there's different reasons for that. It's about provision. Um, it's about different um, socioeconomic backgrounds. But I thought it was interesting that of every year ever, um, a record 37% of 18-year-olds came into higher education. Um, you might think, well, hang on a minute, didn't we talk about 50% of people going into higher education? Um, we did many years ago. I think that was dropped by the government quite a few years ago now. But essentially that looked at students of all ages going to higher education, whereas this is the number of students at the age of 18 who go into university or, or other higher education providers. But there were other things going on last year as well, pretty much as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. So between the 15th of January deadline, so when the main cycle closes uh, on a normal year, and the 30th of, that's not supposed to be March, that's supposed to be June. So between 15th of January and 30th of June last year, we saw a 63% increase in applications to study nursing in higher education in the UK. And the acceptances, so the number of students embarking on a nursing degree, went up nearly 24% on the same year in, in 2019. But also the offer rates are higher, and we'll, we'll have a bit more detail about that shortly. So 80% of um, applications got an offer from a university. That doesn't mean that they were guaranteed a place, but it means they were given an offer um, from that application. So this gives you a bit more detail on that. So looking from 2010, to 2020, so the last 10 years, uh, the left-hand side looks at the absolute numbers. So the numbers of students, uh, the number of offers given out uh, from all UK universities, going from just over 870,000 um, in 2010 to over 1 million and 50,000 in 2020. Um, and as a rate of applications, that's gone from 70% um, to 
just under 80% of applications getting being successful in receiving an offer over the space of 10 years. So that's some quite interesting statistics. If you're wondering why in 2011 that went down, that was because that was just before the tuition fees went up. And so we had a surge of applications that year. So a smaller proportion of them got a got an offer because we only have a, a limited capacity in universities. But that capacity has been increasing as demand has increased as well. What does that mean for your students? Well, it shows that it's an incredibly competitive market and that universities are keen to attract students and that a very high proportion of students will get an offer. Now that offer might be, but you need to get three A's or three A stars to get in, but they are getting an offer. Universities are saying yes to students. Other things of interest. So this is this year's data. So where have we got to? So you'll be aware that the main deadline uh, for applications has um, ended a few weeks ago. This, this year, there was an extension of a fortnight uh, to account for um, students and colleges having less time to prepare those applications. So the deadline was the 29th of January this year compared to the 15th of January normally. And we've seen 18 year old applications up 11.4% on 2020 entry. Now remember that last year didn't see a decrease, we saw an increase, but it's an 11% on top of that. We've also seen that mature students are applying to the university in greater numbers as well. And that's something we've seen over history in that when we see a, a, de a depression, a recession happening in the economy, we see um, people returning to higher education. And there's many reasons to think that over the next three years as the economy um, will recover, we hope, um, certainly hope so, um, but over a number of years, then lots of people see this as the moment for them to apply to higher education, to reskill, to refocus where their careers are. Um, and so we tend to see in, in times of depression. So, so in 2008, for example, as well, 2008, 2011, we saw an increase in mature students as well because of the, the recession that we saw um, in that point in history. So we've seen some increase in over 35s. And this is just undergraduate level, but that's reflected at postgraduate level as well. But what I thought was particularly interesting this year is we pick out some of the subject level changes. So yes, overall, we've seen an 11% increase, but where are those increases happening? And you, you perhaps aren't surprised to see that medicine and subjects allied to medicine are driving some of that change. So we've seen, we've actually seen an increase, um, a, a bigger increase than the national increase in our medicine applications this year. Um, ours are up more than 14%, but that's a really big increase. Um, so 14% increase in applications to medicine, 21% increase in other subjects allied to medicine. So that includes nursing, it includes midwifery, it includes things like um orthoptics, it includes radiotherapy, physiotherapy, those sorts of different programs, seeing an increase in applications there. Um, in veterinary science, we've seen an increase of 22% in agriculture. Um, the physical science is 5%, but it's not just in the science, it's not just in the, um, it's not just in, in medicine and, and nursing. So um, creative arts and design are also seeing an increase of about 11%. Business and administration, which has been very popular for quite a long time now, seeing an increase of 13%. But where are we seeing decreases? And, and European languages are seeing a decrease, about 12% nationally. Um, we're still quite popular for that at, at Southampton. We've got a great department in that area. But um, that's, I think, a, a, a real challenge. I think it's a real difficulty. Um, and I think we should be looking at, if we're going to continue to trade globally, uh, we need to look at how we, and, and how we uh, encourage people to study European languages, but also the um, non-European languages have also seen a decline this year as well. And I think that's something that we perhaps should be concerned about and encourage our students to, to take those options. We've also seen a decline nationally of history and philosophy and subjects like that um, of about two and a half percent this year. Um, and that's, that's also a real shame. And all of these subjects make up the broad sort of tapestry of, of higher education that we have in this country. And we'd like to see um, the applications increase across all of those. So something to think about, increasingly competitive this year for medicine, increasingly competitive 
um, for those subjects allied to medicine and, and veterinary. Um, perhaps less competitive this year for European languages, history, philosophy, English, those sorts of subjects, geography perhaps as well. So quite a, quite a change, um, and this year perhaps more pronounced than it has been in previous years. So how has that impacted on us? Well, of course, last year was quite remarkable. Um, the coronavirus has had a real, a real impact on us. Uh, you'll recall the, the exams being cancelled across most uh, sorts of exams last year. Uh, confirmation and clearing in 2020 was, was quite a nightmare. And Shuna and I have had conversations about that um, in the past. We had to redo things on a number of occasions. And if you think about how we work, and we work on our historical data that we've had, we know approximately how many students are going to apply. We know approximately how many of them to give an offer to. And we have a good guess about the sorts of grades they're likely to achieve. So where to pitch those offers in order to control our numbers. And we only ever have certain amounts of laboratory space or lecture theatre space or, or teachers and lecturers for different subjects. Then last year threw us quite a curveball as the government did its numerous U-turns as we went through the summer. And I know that was a um, a challenge for the, the, the colleges, and it was a challenge for us in the university as well. What does that mean for this coming year? Well, nothing's going smoothly at the moment, and, and we obviously know that schools are coming back um, and colleges are coming back in, in some ways from next week. Uh, we know that exams have been cancelled and that um, teacher assessed grades are going to be the main uh, determinant of, of A-level and, and other qualification outcomes. So what are we get, what are we doing? We're we're probably expecting to see some of those grades go up, and we saw that last year as well. Uh, what does that mean for whether students achieve the outcomes of their grades? Um, that's becoming quite a challenge. We're not even exactly sure what date we're getting the results this year either. My understanding is that it's the tenth of August, um, but the the letter from the Minister for Education of Higher Education um, wasn't quite that clear this morning. Um, we do know that we're expecting to have um, A-level results, for example, and Scottish results and GCSEs all in the same week this year, and that will present um, a slightly different challenge. But what impact has the pandemic had on students? Well, 83% are saying that their course choice hasn't changed. So maybe that 17% that's saying it has are those that have moved towards medicine, nursing and the like. 80% um, are still committed to going to higher education in 2021. And we know that our applicants are thinking long term. So looking at employability, what are the expected outcomes? What is the degree going to achieve for them? So I wanted to reflect a little bit about what actually happens at universities and, and what we're there for. And, and quite a, a lot of time last year was explaining that we'd never actually closed. And whilst we might have stopped our teaching activity, a lot of our research continued. And I think um, I've certainly found in the year I've been at Southampton that I've been pretty much blown away by the activity that goes on. It's been an ideal sort of case study for seeing why universities are important and why they're exciting places for, for students to be. And we exist really to, to try and find answers to the world's biggest questions. And, and that's why we were set up. Um, hundreds of years ago in Oxford and Cambridge were the first in this country. St Andrews was and Aberdeen were, were pretty sharpish behind that. Um, and various other countries developed their universities across different models throughout that period of history. But always it's been about creating new knowledge, finding out new understanding and determining some of the answers to the world's biggest questions. I usually talk about climate change at this point, but I'm not going to because we've got something else. Um, we talk about world economics, trade, law, history, archaeology, looking at engineering and some of the exciting advances we have there and how things like our engineering, technology, computing can perhaps reduce the impact of climate change, um, looking at what the future might hold. And I always think that's interesting in terms of the sorts of things students are going on to. And a lot of the jobs that students will be progressing into after university, and, and if we think they join us in 2022. So those of you with students in year 12, joining us at university in 2022, perhaps graduating in 2025, some of those jobs they're going into don't even exist at the moment. And I think the rapid changes are quite remarkable. And as a student, they get access to that cutting edge thinking and technology 
um, and are encouraged to bring their own opinions, thoughts and experiences to that learning environment. And I just wanted to have a bit of a, um, a canter through the sorts of things that happened in spring last year as we learnt about the um, pandemic and how the University of Southampton, so the local university, one of the local universities to Barton Peveril, was um, doing work from the very start of, that, of us knowing about that pandemic and making it an exciting place um, to be working. So I've taken some of the stories um, from our own research that have been undertaken throughout the, the, the last few months. And we think quite often about the pandemic and, it, and it's been a tragic time and many of us have lost um, loved ones, but it's been a, a real opportunity to uh, understand the, the role the university can have. So back as early as January last year, we um, were our World Pop project and, it, and it's a, a global project, um, but it's based at the University of Southampton and it incorporates geographers, demographers, um, epidemiologists, we've heard a lot more about those recently, um, and they were doing work in pop mapping the population and mapping tra travel between populations to determine which sort of cities and provinces might be most affected by the spread of what it then was called the novel coronavirus um, of 2019. And so before we even had any real idea of how it would impact our own lives, our researchers were looking at that. And from areas such as geography, um, and demography. And as we moved into March, then our faculty of medicine really started doing exciting things, trialing an inhaled drug. So I think this is the interferon um, drug that the uh, professors of respiratory medicine in, in our faculty of medicine were looking at trialing as to whether it could worsen, uh, whether it could make better the worst effects of um, coronavirus. And we were doing some uh, trials on, on, on patients on the inhaled drug, um, which we're doing in about 100 patients in Southampton and further afield. So really starting into the, the medical side of our research there by March. And also in March, our engineers quickly stepped up to the plate, um, working with um, other areas and, and industrial partners. So we work a lot with industry. Um, in this case, it was McLaren, more, more probably uh, famous for their cars and their, their Formula One, but also Kemp Sales and, and Indo on creating a prototype of a personal respirator. So using our engineering um, expertise in bioelectronics to see how we can limit the, the spread of the disease at the time. And it's interesting looking at how the language changes um, before it really started to impact on us. In April, our biological sciences were working with partners in Texas um, to look at the exact bits of the virus um, that, that enables it to, to infect the, the human body. And, and that enabled the, the fast forward, if you like, of some of the, the vaccine research which was going on. Um, we also, and our students and, and some graduates in engineering, started using their 3D design, 3D printing to develop PPE and, and fast prototyping to get some of those um, masks and shields for, for people working on the front line into um, working life. Equally, geography and environmental sciences, we're looking at social inequality and how the pandemic affects different groups of people better. And in this research, they identified self-employed people um, and women particularly being affected more than men. We also looked at household waste and, and knowing that all of those, um, we all knew the tip was um, closed and that caused us all, all problems, I, I imagine. But it, but it demonstrated a 300% increase in fly tipping in rural communities. So how um, a pandemic affects other areas. We also looked at young people and how they understand government messaging. So this was a collaboration between our education department and our faculty of medicine in terms of the different ways, different support they might feel uh, staying at home and how um, potential approaches can, um, can allow us to safely come out of a national lockdown. And that was as early as May last year. Um, a couple more, computational scientists working with colleagues in the University of California, San Diego, looking at vaccines and, and how new antivirals and vaccines might combat um, the new coronavirus with their modelling um, and simulation techniques. And, and really, I think it's important to see that in terms of the, uh, quite often we think of coronavirus as just being about medicine and nursing and how we do that, but actually engineers, geographers, 
epidemiologists, um, the education school, people looking at law, people in terms of what powers the government has to lock us down, people looking at economics, what the impact is on the economics. And it just demonstrates the sort of multidisciplinary and, and fascinating approach that universities take to any given problem. And you can apply that to a pandemic, you can apply it to um, climate change and all of those different areas. So I hope that sort of demonstrates the sort of exciting work that goes on um, in universities and particularly in research intensive universities. But for a student, it can still be quite difficult to understand how that applies for them. So why do students go? Well, essentially, it's about pursuit of knowledge and we really want students to want to learn. It's a three year commitment. They've got to thoroughly enjoy what they're doing and it enables them to get a deeper insight into a subject that they love. But it also helps with their careers and, and the statistics continue to show that lifetime earnings um, and, and graduate jobs are, are very much improved by having undertaken an undergraduate degree. It enables students to develop skills and confidence. So regardless of their subject, what we call transferable skills are developed in them. And I hope it allows them to have some fun. And we're certainly looking forward to upping the levels of fun as we move out of the national lockdown in coming weeks and months and getting back to some sort of normality. So in advising students, what do we tend to do? We tend to talk about the different sorts of universities out there. And there are perhaps 300 places in the UK you can do a degree, different types, different sizes, different um, focuses on what they do, different types of course that they offer at different levels. Some very practical, some very theoretical, some with um, 28 hours of, of in-person teaching per week, some with only four or five with a lot of self-directed learning. So all of those things will contribute towards that decision. The entry requirements will be a major factor. What, what do I need to get as a student in order to gain access to that particular um, course at that particular university? But also more practical things. How much does it cost? How much does it cost to live there? How much are the fees? How much does it cost to be in halls of residence? What's the likelihood of being um, able to get a, um, a part-time job, for example? How far away is it from home? I know when I was um, uh, choosing a university, uh, and I'm from Preston originally, and for that reason, I wanted to get as far away from home as possible. And I applied to Aberdeen. Um, I applied to various of the universities a long way away um, to do my geology course. And that was a major factor for me. Now, as it happens, I ended up much closer to home um, in Liverpool. But it is all these sorts of things that need to be thought through and considered in the context of that choice of, of which university to go to. But also which course to choose. And, and I like to encourage students to think about what they actually like to do. So quite often we think about what the um, employability prospects are, but there's some really very employable fields. But if you don't enjoy the subject, then you're not going to have a good time at university and your, your potential for success is likely to be reduced. How is the course taught? Is it taught in lectures? Are there practical sessions? Is there a lot of laboratory time? Is the opportunity to do placements, go for a year in industry, a year abroad, all of those sorts of options but importantly to keep an open mind. So not just considering those subjects that a student does in their college courses, but other things that they may never have thought of um, that are available as well. There's lots of places to do research. UCAS is the central repository for that and every course is listed on the UCAS website with the details of fees, entry requirements, um, everything you might want to know about them. There are lots of independent guides out there and, and the move to digital has made more and more of those available. We have our own websites and prospectuses, um, but of course we always put the best things in there and our favorite lead tables and lots of sunshine filled pictures of happy students. So it's really important to dig underneath that and see exactly what that experience might be. Uh, lead tables are an important source of information. We'll come back to those shortly. Um, admissions tutors and, and inquiries teams. It's quite often I find that the prospective students hesitate in asking us at the university um, a question because they think we might put a black mark against their name and then never let them in. Um, but actually, we want to answer those questions. If there's a question about the course content or who teaches it or the sorts of topics they might study or how many hours, if it's not answered on our website, then do ask us the questions. 
talk to people who are already there. There's a growing array, array of ways you can talk to current students, for example, um, either those that are already at university that you know in your friendship group or families, but also via websites like the Student Room, via Unibuddy, um, use the Unifrog website, and I think Bart and Peveril are working with Unifrog, and help narrow down those options that are out there. But there's countless um, areas to get information from, and of course, using Bart and Peveril's very well-resourced um, career service and the, the next two weeks of fairs to really understand what the different options are out there. I talked a little bit about league tables and you can slice and dice league tables in universities any way you like and they all have a different answer in their attempts to rank universities. They might talk about the best universities in the world, the best in the UK. They might talk about specific subjects. It might be the best as voted for by students, the best as voted for by researchers, might even be just the best for selling newspapers if they don't put Cambridge Oxford at the top and everyone wants to know why. But what's important to your student, what's important to um, that person as they embark on the course they want to study and where that's going to take them in their career. And that's the most important bit. And to give you an idea of the different things that universities, that league tables use, here are the different ways that three of the big league tables choose their, um, their, their ranking. So the Guardian looks at what sort of A-level, B-Tech, IB grade students get on the way in. In fact, all of them do that. They all, to some extent, look at student satisfaction as well. Some might look at completion rates as to how many students get to the end of their course successfully and what grades they get out of that. Some will look at research. So the Complete University Guide and the Times and Sunday Times ones look at research, but the Guardian doesn't. So how important is that to you? If you want to be in a research intensive environment, then other details might tell you more than the Guardian, for example. But it's really important that students understand what those details are telling you and to use their own uh, ranking of important factors to determine which university they apply to. So where's the best place to go? Well, I put Southampton there because, of course, I have to. Um, but the really best place for a student to go is a place that matches their aspirations, their expected or predicted results, and the sort of experience and course that they are looking for at university. So once they've decided where to apply, as I talked about, then the power shifts back to us. So what are we actually looking for from our applications? We want people to have that intellectual or creative ability. We want people to succeed on our courses. And that's the most important thing. It's in nobody's interest. It's not in the student's interest or our interest that a student comes on to a university course and then struggles. So we're looking for people who have the ability and backgrounds in education to succeed on our programme. So that's whether they suit the course. So have the, they might need to have done different subjects. So, for example, in engineering, we'll quite often ask for maths and physics, because in order to complete that course, you have to have a strong grounding in maths and physics. We might be looking and we are looking for evidence of motivation and commitment. So how can they tell us? How can they demonstrate to us that this is a subject that they're really interested in and they want to spend three, four or five years learning about it? So those applicants with a range of interests and experiences and also people who are willing to get involved in something. So what extracurricular activities are they doing as well? And overall, how have they demonstrated a real passion for that particular subject? And how will we determine that? Well, first of all, we'll look at your academic profile. So including GCSE results, for example, where we have them or equivalent. We will look at current qualification predictions. So we'll be asking uh, your teachers and tutors. Uh, students, teachers and tutors about what their teachers think they're going to achieve in their um, in their grades. Uh, this year, of course, that's going to be particularly important because we're not doing exams. Uh, we also ask teachers and tutors for a reference and we ask the, your teachers and tutors to be honest. So an honest appraisal of what they think the potential to succeed on that particular course is for that student. And we do want um, teachers and tutors to be honest in that and give us their best, best opinion of how that student is going to succeed. We might look at work experience, particularly where those programmes require it, so things like medicine. We might undertake interviews or auditions or portfolios, so particularly for creative programmes and some of the um, very competitive uh, clinical ones, for example. And of course, we'll look at the personal statement 
and that's a key part of UCAS form as well, which I'll talk in a little bit more detail about. So how do we use it? Well, we do use it as part of selection and they are read in universities, um, in every university to a greater or lesser extent. But the most important thing is that there are two areas, two moments when that personal statement is really vastly important. The first one is at the decision-making stage for the university and where a student is borderline and where we're not quite sure whether they're gonna be able to succeed in our program, the personal statement may tip us one way or the other. So is it giving us the additional evidence that says this is a student who really wants to embark on this particular course? But it's also used um, at confirmation. So if, for example, the student has missed out on a grade, um, their exams didn't go well, or they didn't quite achieve what they thought they were going to, we might then go back to the um, personal statement because we might have 10 places left on a course. But we've got 20 students who've missed out by a grade. Which 10 are we going to take? We might then go back to those applications to look at what they are, and we might use them in clearing as well. And why is it important? Well, it's really often the only personal information we'll get from a student. So we know what grades we've got. We know what school or college you went to. We know not what, what course you've applied for. But it gives us some idea of who this person is. So universities do use it to get that sort of information. Because just the fact that you've got two A's and a B at A level um, or you've got distinctions in your BTEC, doesn't really give us a, a, an insight into who you are and, and why you've chosen that particular course. And because most courses don't interview, the personal statement is the best place to get it. And it's a student's opportunity to really impress us and differentiate yourself from everyone else who's applied to that particular programme. So what are we looking for when we, when we go through that application? Well, we want to know, have they chosen the right subject for the right reasons? Do they understand it? So, for example, if a student wants to study history, then some universities will focus only on a particular period of history. They might look just at modern history. And so if it's a university like that and the student has said in their personal statement, well, actually, I'm fascinated by the medieval period, then that's going to ring alarm bells in the admissions tutor's head. And we might determine that they're not suited to a particular programme. We want to get some idea that the student is mature enough to survive and, and succeed at higher education. So where have they demonstrated that they're able to juggle lots of different things? Their, you know, their schoolwork, their college work, maybe a part time job, maybe their other activities, maybe they've got involved in other things. Maybe they're a carer, maybe they're any number of different things. They might get involved in team sports, in drama. Are they able to balance their life and their workload? Because it's quite a, it's quite a step away. When students go to, to higher education, and I think parents, it takes some getting used to for parents as well, that they don't necessarily have those parents' evenings, they don't have the, the access to um, letters written by the school or college or emails that they receive, because by the time a student goes to university, they're 18 and they are a real person in their own right. And so we communicate with the student, and I think that can take some getting used to, and we want to see that a student is ready for does the personal statement confirm the depth of interest in the study and what has the candidate studied independently? And that's probably one of the most important things to demonstrate in a personal statement. If you've only done what was on the syllabus in order to pass your exams or your assessments, then it doesn't really give us an idea that you're really very excited about that particular programme. So, for example, if you're doing English literature and you've only read the books that are on your um, English literature curriculum, then how do we know that you're going to be looking at and able to comprehend the vast numbers of texts that we might expect you to read as an English literature student? And there's lots of different ways of getting that experience. And I'd encourage students, particularly in, in lockdown, to really take advantage of, of the sorts of things that are happening, where now geography, in terms of where things are happening, is less of an issue. So I did some... Um, desk research this afternoon there's the sorts of things if I was applying to a university that you might be able to get involved in and go along to over the next couple of weeks so a quick look at university websites because that's where a lot of this happens but also on the radio um, on uh, other forums that you might have lots of stuff that can develop your knowledge and interest and broaden how you think about a subject are available so example on Wednesday 
Um, John Sopel, um, you might know him from the BBC News. He is a, a Southampton graduate and he's doing a talk called Unprecedented Politics, Pandemics and the Race that Trumped All Others about following the American election campaign. So if I was a student going into anything from politics to economics to American history, then that might be something of interest. It's free. Sign up on the university website. At SOAS, which is a, um, a college of the University of London, they've got a talk next Tuesday about vaccination inequality in an interconnected world. So you might want to think, if you're going along to a medicine interview soon, that that might be of interest in terms of how global health um, is impacted by a pandemic. That also feeds into po politics, economics, development studies. In At the University of Liverpool this Thursday at 5pm, again, without leaving your sofa or your desk, agents of punishment and protection assessing the demonic in the in first millennium um, Egypt. So if you want to study Egyptology or ancient history, that might be an option for you. At UCL next Thursday at one o'clock, transdisciplinary robotics. And I don't even really know what that means, but there's a talk on that for you. It's free. Again, go to the website to sign up. And at Aberdeen, just because it's probably as far as you can get away from Southampton, but next Thursday, you can go and see a lecture on engaging community and landscape, the role of sacred singing as a soundscape to a way of life. So there's any number of things which if a student is struggling and thinking, well, hang on a minute, I've been in lockdown, I've lived through a pandemic, it's not fair. How am I supposed to tell a university that I'm interested in their subject? Well, go and have a look at the vast wealth of activities that are out there. And probably the best option for that, and I have to do this as a shameless plug, is SOTSEF. Some of you will be familiar with this. It's running from Friday um, for the next couple of weeks, and it's the University of Southampton's award-winning science festival, covering everything across science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. And again, it's free. Have a look at some of those activities that are available. There's the website, sotsef.co.uk. So in summary, and I'm conscious that I've spoken to the screen, I hope you can hear me, otherwise it was a big waste of 40 minutes. But there are fantastic benefits of going to university and consistently we show that students have fantastic career um, satisfaction. They are consistently um, earning more than their um, non-graduate friends and they are having a fantastic time over three years where they build their connections. They understand more about the world that we live in and are better prepared to achieve um, once they have left. It's important that they do their research and put the effort in so as a student, it will be rewarded. Look at what different universities are offering. Different courses with the same name in different universities can be really quite distinct from each other. So make sure you understand what you're applying to. Do take advantage of all the activities that are out there that will enable you to demonstrate how interested you are in that subject and broaden your mind as to the different sorts of subjects available. Engage with all those activities over the next couple of weeks that Barton Peveril's putting on. Um, this is a, a really useful and fantastic couple of weeks of activities. Make sure you use them. And students, make sure you understand that this is your decision about your future. It's a great big decision. It's very difficult to make it in, between the ages of 16 to 18 when you start narrowing down those options. But with the support of your teachers and parents um, and everyone else in your life, you'll be able to make the right decision and good luck with it. And I think that's about the end of my um, talk. There's my email address there. So d.winstanley at soton.ac.uk. And if anybody has a follow up to that, then please do um, send them. But I'm hoping that some questions are coming to the chat sooner and we can get those answered. I'm still waiting for questions, David, but whilst we're waiting, I just wanted to say, A, that was the most brilliant talk. It was exactly what I was looking for. Thank you very much. And it's really good to get a university view because we did we do talks and we say about why to go to university. And it, but it was really interesting to see your perspective about the whole the research that people are having to that, that people do at university and the fact that students can get really involved with that. And I think that's so exciting about uni. Um, and it's something that we don't necessarily, we kind of touch on, but not enough. Um, the other thing is, can I really stress to everybody the SOTSEF stuff? I've already put it on the Aspire Google Classroom. Um, we've advertised it on the Tutor Bulletin. But the Science um, and Technology and Engineering Festival that Southampton run is second to none. And uh, students should definitely engage with that if they can. Um, 
also uh, there's the Aspire Talks. You mentioned talks. Uh, thank you for your the heads ups on those other ones. But we also have, uh, I hope parents know that we have a weekly series of talks at Barton um, where we've had loads of fantastic speakers from, from Southampton, really fantastic. Um, but from now, now it's great. We can also get speakers from all around the country. Um, so that's been really exciting. And so students can A, um, access recordings of the talks and they can also see the talks live on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, and the other things to give you the heads up on is at the end of the week for parents, we'll be sending out um, screencasts all about um, getting into university, the, you know, how to apply, how to help your child. Um, there's just there'll be a, there'll be a series of, um, of, sc of screencasts, so um, look out for those. They'll come out to parents at the end of the week. And on Wednesday, uh, I know it clashes with the John Sopel talk, which I have actually promoted on um, on Aspire. Um, but uh, there is a talk on student finance on on Wednesday at six o'clock. Um, very important which is very important so that's that's aimed at parents as well so you can get your kids to go to the john sober talk and you parents can go to the student finance talk um so tom has asked um will there be a range of online open days this year at times when students can engage with them e.g evenings and weekends and thanks for a great talk yeah i think that's right and, and we're trying to um trying to get those activities in a balance of Recorded recorded talks that people can then access later, um, and other ones. So I think our our online open days in October we moved to the sort of afternoon to evening uh, session, so after school sort of time, because we felt that was best for for students to to access them, um, and we'll be doing those as well as we go through. And we're also hoping to have some element of in person on campus because I think it is important if it's possible and if it's safe to go and really get a feel for a university via um, real real life open days where you can. But certainly um, most universities have got uh, events running at different times of day, different parts of the weekend. And if you're not available at a particular time, you can catch up um, on the recorded and, and videoed activity um, as well. And that, and that can be really valuable. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Max asks, um, where can we find information on online history lectures? And thank you for all the very useful information. Actually, I can jump in there because you've just sent me, the University of Southampton has just sent me their newsletter for this year, this, this month. And there are some great um, history things happening this month, uh, which we'll be posting on the Tutor Bulletin and on the, on the Google Classrooms as well. Um, but is there anything else that you want to add to that? David? I think it's just about um, looking at um, I mean, I literally spent about four minutes finding those um, those those lectures in a range of different places. And usually if you go to any University you Likes website in the events column, um, you'll find all manner of things that, that you'll find interesting. I don't think we've quite got to the technologically advanced um, space of having them all in one place, which would be really helpful. I, I understand that. Um, but I think any universities that, that have um, particularly good history programmes you should be able to find some activities activities from them. Yeah, and parents, actually, we've also been really involved this year in the Speakers for Schools programme, um, which is an, an excellent um, uh, platform for, they get speakers across, and th there are academics, but there are also employers, there are celebrities, you know, actors, musicians, all sorts of things. And we uh, promote that on our, um, on our tutor bulletin. And students are really engaged with that. They've also been offering virtual work experience. So there's a lot of stuff out there now in the virtual space because, you know, which has made a, a massive difference to students. Um, Sue asks, how important is having work experience? It's obviously been very difficult for kids to get work experience over the last year. So I think different courses will require different levels of work experience and, and, and relatively few sort of demands that you, that you must have it. I think also, um, you know, we, we've all lived through this pandemic as well. And I think we all understand that um, the work experience that's been available and perhaps continues to be available <coughs> as we go through the rest of the year is going to be quite limited. And I think um, I'd encourage students to try and find all those other opportunities to get involved, to see what's going on, whether it's through live events um, or, or other media that they can do in order in order to understand that. And I think 
what we would like to see, I suppose, is a reflection as to what being in that job might be like. Um, and and that's, that's really what the work experience is about. So it's like with medicine. You know, we, we don't expect people to do work experience um, with a doctor because we think that will make them a better doctor. It's about understanding what being a doctor is like and what that, you know, that, that that's going into a profession, it's going into a vocation. So what does that actually mean and how is the student reflected on that in terms of then knowing that that's the right thing for them to do? Um, so I think over the next couple of years, we'll be grappling with, with students who haven't had those opportunities um, as perhaps they might have done in the past to do that hands-on work experience. So it'll be finding other ways of trying to communicate that understanding. Yeah, and can I can I um, fly the flag for MOOCs as well, massive online yeah. open courseware. Um, Unifrog has a whole section on them. Uh, if you look on the Future Learn or the iTunes U uh, websites, there's some great courses out there, which whilst they're not work experience, a lot of them can give you a real insight into what it's like to work in certain areas. So, I def and, and they're all free. I would really encourage you not to pay up for the certification at the end. Um, if students take a screenshot of, their, of the fact that they've, co they've covered 100% of it, then, then we can certificate them at the end. So, um, but that generally they should be free. Um, I think that's a really good point, actually, Shuna. We, we've got one um, that uh, Professor Rachel Mills runs, who's our Dean of our um, Life Sciences, Environmental Life Sciences, um, in the oceans. So if you're interested in anything to do with oceans, oceanography, marine biology, that sort of thing, there's a great free MOOC available. And we have students joining us from, and I can't remember what it's called, but the, the most remote school in the world, which is in an island um, further away, if you will, from New Zealand, if you're looking on a traditional um, projection of a map um, in the South Pacific, and um, we posted out a certificate to that person as being the, the furthest flung person uh, to complete our oceanography mood. So um, have a look out for that one as well. Good, yeah, definitely look out for that one. Um, Tabitha asks, where can students find recommended further reading for specific subjects by unis? That's a very good question. Um, some universities will, will be quite open about that and they might have um, initial reading lists in the module specifications and that sort of thing. Now, some of that will take some digging, but in most university courses on their websites, you'll be able to dig down into what the modules have and that may you should be able to find the recommended reading in that and that'll give a, a good um, idea in that. I imagine that the um, college will be able to recommend some, some good stuff as well. Because um, some of the stuff that you'll find in universities will be limited access, depending on the um, electronic resources that they have. But, you know, head to the libraries. There's loads of stuff in the libraries um, that you'll be able to have access to and, and will help with that. Um, and I think and that varies from very sometimes quite dry and stale academic journals through to latest publications, you know, and things like Nature or, you know, the big journals that you can. Um, that you can either purchase or access for online, um, having fantastic stuff available. Yeah, and there's so many brilliant you know, popular science or popular psychology or popular whatever books now. They've, it's really brilliant how, how a lot of kind of nonfiction writers have, have actually made some more seemingly inaccessible subjects more accessible uh, to, to, to normal people. Um, so definitely go for those. And the Glynn Library can really help with advice on that. Um, Shelley asks, do you have any advice on picking more specialised subjects or more general ones, e.g. astrophysics versus physics? And great talk, thank you. I think it's about digging into what the actual course is and what actually floats your boat. So as an example, I always wanted to do geography. Um, and when I was doing my A-levels, I did geography. Sorry, that's sorry. Not my dog. No, it's my dog. <laughs> um, and but I knew that I was particularly interested in the physical side of geography and, you know, lakes, mountains, glaciers, volcanoes, more than people, population, demographics and that sort of thing. Um, and my teacher at the time suggested that I, I should perhaps look at geology courses. Um, so I ended up doing geology and physical geography because that's what I wanted. In reality, astrophysics or physics. I don't think you're going to be closing any doors in your um, career by doing one of those or the other. Um, and I think it's really about 
uh, whether you want that specialism. Quite often we specialise in um, postgraduate level a bit more than we do in undergraduate. So you might do a broad based physics degree and then specialise a little bit later. But I really think it's about if you're going to do astrophysics, because that's what absolutely fascinates you, then you may well have an, a better time and a more fun time and, and, and enjoy it more by specialising on that and not doing the other bits of physics that you don't like as much um, than if you go down a more generalist. But it's a really very personal um, decision. It's a bit like a history degree. You can get that very broad historical background if you want, or you can decide, well, actually, I'm just going to do ancient history or medieval history or um, American history, for example. So it, it's really looking at the different choices that are, are out there, what it actually looks like in terms of how much of your time you'll spend. And quite often you'll find that in order to do your astrophysics degree, you'll share a lot of those foundation modules in your first and second years with the, for want of a better word, normal physicists um, anyway. So, But then you, the specialism quite often comes in the third year. So you might find that a physics, an astrophysics, a physics with um, physics with astrophysics or a geophysics degree might all have half of the same content in the first and second years. But then as you go through your university career, you'll start to specialise into those bits that you um, particularly are interested in. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, Melanie asks, uh, can all students, <laughs> this is for me, can all students access Aspire to be able to hear the talks? Uh, all the Aspire, the Aspire talks are um, recorded and have been posted on the careers hub of um, the website of the internet under event recordings. Uh, so you can access every single talk that we've had for Aspire. Uh, so I hope that hope that uh, that um, uh, is, answers your question. Um, Justin asks, where can you find, and we'll probably need to make this the last question because I'm very conscious of the time. Where can you find information on sports psychology? Can you start a psychology degree and then specialize in sports psychology? Uh, the short answer to that is yes, you can. Um, I'm not an expert in sports psychology, um, but I'm sure colleagues in the careers team at, at the college will, will be able to do that. In general, again, you can do a generalist psychology degree and then specialize later. Um, but um, Shuna, you might have a better. Yeah, I, that, so if, but if you go to a, one of the more research intensive universities, you're more likely to start with a straight psychology degree and then possibly specialise later. You can do more, more uh, specific courses like a sports psychology degree at a less traditional university. Um, so if that's something that really interests you, then you need to look at something more, um, you know, it, not necessarily Southampton, but you'd, you'd go to one of the less traditional unis. But that's what the careers team are there for. Um, we're around to help. So if anybody has those kind of questions or any other kinds of questions, uh, just make an appointment to see us using um, the careers appointment bookings on the internet. Uh, come and see us anytime, uh, either virtually or hopefully in real life in a couple of weeks. Um, but I think we need to end, end questions there. But as you said, David's very kindly, I think he might regret this, uh, has given his email address. <laughs> uh, this talk will also be um, posted on the Careers Hub and we'll have a special um, uh, the futures, on the Futures Fair Hub as well. Um, and so you'll, everybody will be able to re-see it if you want to. Um, <laughs> but David, I cannot thank you enough. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, it does Anytime. mean it does mean you'll have to be coming back next year and the year after and the year after. Just reuse yeah. the recording. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah, because hopefully one that. day you'll no longer have to talk about COVID. So, you know, you might need to change it one day. Um, but look, it was absolutely perfect. Thank you ever so much. I really do appreciate it. And again, thank you to the University of Southampton for sponsoring the event. Um, that's made a big difference as well. And I hope you you realise that actually you know, we've got a really good footfall at it as well so that's been brilliant okay. so parents thank you very much you'll be hearing from us by the end of the week we'll hopefully see you on wednesday for the student finance talk uh, and we'll hopefully see you and some of your student your children at the uh, whole futures fortnight events thank you very much thanks david thanks everyone bye